When I heard they were bringing Gossip Girl back, I thought I knew how it was going to go. See, Blair and Serena are in their early 30s. They're living in penthouses on the Upper East Side. They haven't spoken for years since Serena and Chuck Bass hooked up at a Hillary Clinton fundraiser. But they're drawn back into conflict when their two adorable children, Preston and Waverly, both enroll at the same elite pre-K program. Who's going to be president of the PTA? Who's going to win the coveted cutest Halloween costume award? Whose child will be on the cover of the summer L.L. Bean catalog? But apparently, no. We have to meet a bunch of new people. The Julian we meet at the beginning of Gossip Girl is already deep into the third act of her own personal rise and fall narrative. She's got a social media empire, and she's damn proud of it. It takes a lot of work to matter like that, to become something and I can't have that taken away from me. But what does it cost her to get there? Obi tells Zoya that Julian was totally different before any of that stuff. He just feels like he's playing her boyfriend now. Meanwhile, Julian was the one who reached out to Zoya and connived to get her to New York, not out of some plot to amass more likes and followers, but out of a genuine desire to have a sister. But once she shows up, Julian can't quite figure out how to relate to her like a real person. Her whole life is so filtered through Instagram filters that the only time she can have a genuine conversation is in the school bathroom. So it seems like Julian is going to be constantly walking a line between the desire to be a good person and the desire to keep those social media numbers up. Because without her followers, who even is she? So far, I gotta be honest, Julian isn't really grabbing me. First of all, is her sister stealing her boyfriend really going to destroy her brand? You as someone who loses is bad for business. I didn't lose anything. I thought people were into her tips on keeping her face fresh after early morning travel. It might make more sense if Obi was the source of a lot of her fame and power, but he seems like just an accessory to her, not the other way around. So it feels like being dumped would just get her sympathy and free her up to date someone who's a better match for her, maybe a fellow influencer who could plan glamping photo shoots with her. The show needs to set up Zoya as a potential rival and threat, but at least in this episode, Zoya couldn't care less about social media fame. Do you really think you can go up against me and win? <laughs> See, that's your problem. You still think there's something to win. Julian, you're safe. Just concentrate on your brooch game. But let's get into the more interesting part of the premiere, the titular Girl on the MTA. The OG Gossip Girl, of course, made the identity of its muckraking blogger a mystery until the very end, at which point there was no reveal that could have made any sense and been remotely satisfying. So I think it's probably wise that we know who Gossip Girl is from the very beginning, a quartet of teachers aiming some slings and arrows at their outrageously fortunate students. Unlike the original show, where it always seemed like Gossip Girl was one of the rich kids playing the Game of Thrones, in the new show, they are the Sparrows. They aren't outsiders in the way that Dan Humphrey was supposedly an outsider because his loft in Brooklyn didn't have a rooftop pool. They are really outsiders, like watching the fashion show via live stream outsiders. So we have class warfare here, but also a generational divide. It's millennials versus Zoomers, although if the teachers didn't dress like they were on WandaVision, you'd never know they were supposed to be older. My early problem with this setup is that the teacher's motives for engaging in this caper are as flimsy as the reasons Julian is supposed to view Zoya as a rival. The way the legend of Gossip Girl is reintroduced here, she was supposedly a corrective force, keeping the bratty kids in line through her public scoldings. We lived under constant threat. People like Nate were scared straight. All the good little waspy boys and girls had better behave or Baba Yaga will blog about you. It's more like Blaga Yaga. No. <laughs> but guys, that isn't really how I remember it. Did anyone on the original show act nicer because they were afraid of getting called out by Gossip Girl? If anything, Gossip Girl pushes people into desperate situations so that she can enjoy their desperate measures. So I'm a little confused about what the teachers think they're accomplishing and why they commit to it so obsessively right from the very beginning. I should be arrested. Y yes, you should be arrested, creepy stalker. You're ready to uh, take the power back, do some good, and 
save the future? But the power to make these kids squabble isn't going to make Monet any more polite in the hallways. No, for Kate, this seems to be about getting vicariously close to the social media stars who literally tower over her. I mean, what is she, like 4'10"? She can't be one of the cool kids, but she can make them dance for her amusement. You can practically feel her adrenaline rush when she gets a 14-year-old girl publicly humiliated. But let's not worry about the logistics of how the fashion show thing worked, or how Zoya went out for a night of drinking and posing for incriminating photographs and still got home before 9 p.m. Whatever you may Not even 9. I'm so glad I could always trust you. Let's focus on the real issue. How the heck does Obi deliver donuts at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and make it back to the Upper East Side before school? I'll wait, Gigi.